Hey folks, before we begin the show, a couple of housekeeping notes for those of you on the podcast. You can call into my program Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Time by calling 1-800-WSB-TALK and join the program. You can listen live at wsbradio.com or stick with the podcast if you like. Also, remember to check out our weekly sponsor for the podcast. If you go to them following the link, this week's sponsor is blueapron.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. It is a fantastic way to help the resurgent. The more you guys shop with our sponsors, the more sponsors we get, the more it helps the resurgent long term. It also helps the Eric Erickson Show. Thanks so much for listening. Now on with the show. Running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Good evening. I'm Eric Erickson of WSB here in the Live Lounge. Joining me, another candidate running for governor. This time, we're beginning the interviews with Democratic candidate Stacey Abrams, arguably the front runner, the former House Minority Leader. Thank you for taking the time to join me tonight. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I want to, with all the other candidates as well, really begin with biography. You have been in public service for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, First of all, though, before we even get into public service, uh, your business background. Sure. I am a tax attorney by training. I went to Yale Law School, uh, graduated in 99, came back to Atlanta, started practicing tax law, and began what my mother refers to as my trajectory of downward economic mobility. Um, So (laughs) I left uh, tax law to become deputy city attorney for the city of Atlanta and then quit that job to go run for the state legislature. And that's when I became an entrepreneur, uh, mainly because I like living inside my house and had to find a way to make a living. Mm-hmm. I started a consulting firm, then merged my firm with uh, my business partner. She and I did infrastructure consulting, so we worked with a lot of uh, large corporations that wanted to do public-private partnerships. Uh, we were doing very well, and then there was this pesky little financial crisis and the end of a real estate market. Um, and after, at the same time, we had a company called Nourish. It was a bottled water for babies and toddlers. That company was doing very well. We actually got a big contract from Whole Foods, but we could not meet the contract because we needed to automate our equipment. And in the midst of the credit crunch, no one would loan two young women with a manufacturing company any money. Uh, We went around to a number number of uh, organizations, to credit unions, to banks, to factoring companies, and kept being told we just were right outside their credit margins. Eventually, we actually had to give up the business because we grew to death. We were too large to continue as we were, but we couldn't get the money to automate. And we looked at each other and thought, well, this is a problem that a lot of companies are having. We had an invoice that was worth something, but we couldn't get anyone to monetize it, to loan us the money against that as real collateral. And so we started a new company called Now Account. And Now Account actually provides uh, access to capital to small businesses. We purchase their invoices. It's a true sale. It's not a loan. And they get access to their capital based on the work they've already done. And so that's the most recent business I started. That opens a segue I didn't expect would come so soon. I, I want to ask you this question because it comes up all the time. And it is across party lines. It is across demographics. And that is, there seems to be a real perception. And it's It surfaced because of the Amazon situation. That it seems like Georgia leaders spend a lot of time trying to attract new businesses into the state and ignoring the businesses that are already here. And I'd love to get your thought on that, particularly given the story you just told. I would say that that is definitely a challenge. I, on the campaign trail, talk about that a lot, that as much as I'm grateful that the state of Georgia has been able to attract new businesses, because that means jobs for folks, the question is not, are we attracting new jobs? It's what are we doing about our homegrown jobs? What are we doing about our homegrown businesses? Uh, I know that if you're in a rural community, it's unlikely you're ever going to become the, the megapolis that is Atlanta. But there are micro-businesses that can help sustain neighborhoods. There are small businesses that can grow communities. And we have to think about those almost more than we think about those mega companies or those regional employers. Because when a small business fails, the community around it suffers. And we do not provide adequate access to capital. So as much as folks want to talk about contracts, which are good, but contracts really focus on singular businesses and have limits because it's a question of who needs, who needs the service at the time. We should be thinking about how do you get access to capital to small businesses so that if you have a cafe, you can expand your your footprint. If you have a home health care business, you can buy additional equipment. Because sometimes it's harder to get a loan for $25,000 or $100,000 than it is to get a loan for $50 million. And it's those folks that I'm worried about. 
who are doing the work of hiring three or four people in their community, but are providing good jobs, solid wages, and sustain stability for their communities. My mission is to do that, to, to invest, and to use the power that we have as a state to actually invest in our homegrown businesses and make certain that they are as important to us as these regional employers are. Now, we were talking before the show began that your parents are both Methodist ministers, they are. and you were from Gulfport, but you made it to Atlanta and, and graduated from Avondale High. I did. Um, in fact, the first African-American valedictorian in Avondale High? In theory. I, that's, in what theory. I, that's what I've been told. <laughs> yes. So what was it like growing up being the child of two ministers? So my parents actually weren't ministers for most of my childhood, although they preached a lot. Um, but that was mainly just telling us what to do. I'm the second <laughs> of six kids. Uh, my mom was Wait, actually, the, the second of six? Second of six. Wow. Yeah. My mom was a college librarian. Uh, my dad was a shipyard worker. We grew up working poor, working class. My mom didn't like that, so she called us the genteel poor. We had no money, but we watched PBS and we read books. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what they did was they, they told us that we had three jobs, go to church, go to school, and take care of each other. Uh, go to church so that we had a moral framework, go to school so that we had the knowledge that we needed to take care of ourselves. But they also said take care of each other because they said no matter how little we have, there's someone with less, and it's your job to serve that person. Uh, my parents took that so seriously that at the age of 40, when I was 15, they decided to become permanently poor and become Methodist ministers. And so we moved from Mississippi <laughs> to Atlanta. They were both admitted to Emory University, to the, the Candler School of Theology. And so we moved from Mississippi to Georgia. They went to school uh, at Emory. I was in high school in DeKalb County. And as I was telling you earlier, I had to type their papers because neither of my parents knew how to type. So I got a crash course in divinity while I was there. Um, but I'm just I'm deeply proud of my parents because they raised the six of us to value faith and education and industry, but also to know that service is an integral part of who we are and what we have to do. So you moved from Mississippi to Atlanta at, at 15, and I, my family was uprooted when my oldest sister was 15 to, to Dubai. And knowing other families who were like that, almost inevitably the 15, 16-year-olds, they want to go back to where they're from, and yet you stayed in the Atlanta area. I, I did. I, I loved Mississippi. My parents are back there. Um, my youngest siblings actually finished school there when my parents moved back after uh, they graduated. I loved Mississippi, and I still do, but... When you're 15 and you live in Gulfport, Mississippi, where at the time we shared the mall with Biloxi, mm -hmm. and your parents tell you you can move to a city where there are like malls on every corner. And nobody wants to share anything with Biloxi. Yeah, exactly. I can say that. I'm from defend, down there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but as a 15-year-old who had an opportunity to go to a big city, I mean, I, I grew up in one of the larger towns in Mississippi, but it was still 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. I was very enamored of the idea of moving to Georgia. And once I graduated from high school at Avondale, I went to Spelman College. I was here uh, for four years in college, worked for the city of Atlanta as a, high, a college student. And Georgia became my home. It's where I've spent the majority of my life, 29 years. Uh, when I was finishing law school and I knew I wanted to be a tax attorney with a specialty in nonprofit organizations, the largest law firm that had that type of practice that really appealed to me was Sutherland. And so coming back to Atlanta got me close enough to Mississippi without crossing Alabama, so I was perfectly happy. <laughs> well put. Thank that you. is very well put. <laughs> <laughs> so y you were for a number of years the House Minority Leader uh, in a state that just all of a sudden flipped Republican in the early 2000s. And one of the things that if you go in, into the, all the research uh, that I dug through, you found a number of Republicans and business leaders talking about they were somewhat hesitant when you became House Minority Leader, and yet businesses in Georgia look at you as someone like they do the mayor of Atlanta they can do business with, uh, as opposed to in some states where there seems to be a growing combativeness between business and the Democratic Party. My position is this. Uh, you first have the responsibility as a state legislator, and certainly as Democratic leader. My job was to get good policy through. Um, sometimes that meant being the opposition, fighting against tax increases, fighting against rollback of reproductive rights. But sometimes your job is to find ways to work together. And actually, at the legislature, most of the time, it's trying to figure out how can you get good done. And I was very intentional about finding ways to negotiate with Republicans to get good done. Uh, the AJC gave me the best compliment I think they've ever given me, which is that they called me strangely relevant. Um, <laughs> But what they meant by that is that 
I, I don't think you have to be combative to disagree. I don't think you have to use ad hominem attacks to make your point. And I don't think you try to convince people that their ideology, that their belief system is wrong. What you do is try to figure out how to engage what they believe and what you believe to get good work done. And so there were moments where, yes, I worked with Democrats and Republicans, confused everybody. I mean, in 2012, I got an A rating from the Georgia Chamber of Commerce and the Friend of Labor Award. And I don't think either of them know why that happened. Uh, but for me, it was a perfect moment because what it signaled is that I, I believe in workers, but I also know workers want to work for businesses that can afford them. They want to live in strong communities. I know that standing up for Atlanta, which is where I'm from, did not require that I diminish Taylor County, that I fight against Screven. It meant that I was responsible for navigating and negotiating on behalf of everyone. This isn't a, it's not a fight. We're all working for the same purpose. Our goal is to lift up the lives of Georgians. We may disagree about how we get there, but we should all have the same basic purpose. And as long as you remember what the purpose is, you can usually find a way to, if you can't agree, then to disagree in a reasonable way and preserve the opportunity to work together the next time. You mentioned Scriven and Taylor and living down near Wilkinson County and seeing the rural poverty in that area. There seems to be a growing divide in the state between rural Georgia and urban Georgia and a real perception, rightly or wrongly, and I lean towards rightly, that Atlanta consumes a lot of resources at the expense of the rest of the state. Um, as governor, what would you do to, to fix that balance? I, I think there, there are two pieces to that. Uh, the first piece is which Georgia do we want to live in? There's the Georgia that was, the Georgia that is, and there's the Georgia that will be. And I think in the Georgia that will be, we have to understand that folks who live in rural Georgia, a lot of them don't want to be Atlanta. What they want, though, is to be able to take care of their families. They want to be able to respect the land where they live and stay in the communities where they grew up. Some want the ability to, to leave and want the education they need to do so. And so our responsibility is not to foment a divide between Atlanta, the metro Atlanta area, and the rest of Georgia, but to respect the nature of each of those communities. When I first became a state legislator, DeBose Porter was minority leader. He's from Lawrence County. And he told me something very clearly. He said, you are not an Atlanta state representative. You are a Georgia state representative. Your responsibility is to vote for your constituents, but to remember that your votes impact everyone. When I became minority leader, I traveled to almost every county in Georgia. I'm only missing four. Seminole, Brantley, Eccles, and Ben Hill. I've been to every other county in Georgia. And the reason I did that was that my job was to help solve those problems, to answer those questions. And the reason I want to be governor is that I figured out what we should be doing, that we have to knit together the nonprofit sector, the for-profit sector, the business sector, that we have to respect small communities and make sure that they have the ability to grow their economy, that we have to preserve their hospitals. When hospitals shut down, you can't get a business to come. When children don't graduate from high school, no one's going to hire them. And so we've got to do the work of actually building the capacity of those communities. And that does require very intentional leadership. But it's not leadership that pits Atlanta against rural communities. It's leadership that understands the distinct nature of each of those and is willing to invest in rural broadband and transit. Because if you live in Talbot County, there's not a grocery store or a hospital. You need transit to get to Muskogee so you can go shopping and go to the doctor. We have to understand the need for mobile economies. And that's one of the reasons I've put out plans to talk about how do we use advanced energy, hydro, biomass, wind, and solar to help folks. There are farmers in Camilla, Georgia that are leasing out their farmland for solar farms, able to make a little extra money to take care of their families. And so I want to be the governor who thinks of rural Georgia as a place of innovation, a place of investment, but also who understands that fundamentally the poverty of rural Georgia is obscene and has to be disrupted. I'm Eric Erickson interviewing Stacey Abrams, candidate for governor in Georgia. When we come back, uh, we'll talk about education, where she's been able to find common ground with Republicans and also stand up to them.
Stacey Abrams joining me. Uh, you were the House Minority Leader. You, you left to run full-time for governor. I did. Um, which gives you somewhat of an advantage in that those who stayed can't fundraise while there's the never-ending <laughs> session. Um, so good for you on that. They, while they are there, they are arguing right now, as they always do, on how to improve education. And it, it seems like you and the Republicans clashed on some issues on education, but you... There's really been a, a bipartisan or nonpartisan consensus on charter schools of the state, and you're particularly trying to figure out what's going on with our public schools in the state. So I, I don't think anyone will deny that there are challenges with our public school. The question is what created those problems and how do you solve them? We know for a fact that in Georgia, poverty is the strongest predictor for economic, I mean, for ad, academic failure. We know that when you cannot see the chalkboard because you don't have glasses when you come to school hungry, when you are transient, those things interfere with your ability to learn. And so the question has always been around how do we solve the problem? The partisan divide has typically typically been Democrats believe we need to invest more, Republicans believe it's a leadership issue. I will say the answer is usually yes. And that we know that we defunded our schools through austerity cuts for decades. And when you are a school that's already on the edge, it's going to get even worse. But there have also been challenges with leadership that have to be addressed. I opposed the Opportunity School District because a takeover that concentrated that amount of power in a single person without public input, without community intervention is problematic and was wrong. Uh, But this year, in 2017, as leader, I also worked with Republicans, worked with Kevin Tanner to craft a bill that actually, for the first time, really got us closer to a solution. And I'm proud of the work we were able to do. When we come back, we'll continue talking about education and also Atlanta traffic. What can the state, what can the governor do to solve the traffic nightmare? We'll be back. Folks, I wanted to do a quick timeout to tell you about this week's sponsor, Blue Apron. You probably have heard of Blue Apron. You've seen their advertisements. I have to tell you, I have tried several of their competitors and then tried Blue Apron, and it is fantastic. Um, A lot of people, you're confused because there are so many of these services out there. If you don't know what Blue Apron is... It is a great company that sends you recipes to your house, and not just the recipes, but all the ingredients. In fact, Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. You guys know I like to cook, and Blue Apron makes it really easy, and they have great plans to choose from. A two-person meal plan, a family meal plan, a wine plan. My family does the family meal plan. We get two meals a week. For four people, we've done the uh, soy glazed chicken. We've done the um, beef medallions with pan sauce. Last week, we did the Mexican casserole. It's all delicious, and all the ingredients come in the box. They make it really easy for you. In fact, ours shows up on a Thursday uh, by FedEx, and we're ready to cook, and it's good to go. Really delicious recipes, easy to follow along as well. If you're hesitant about cooking, you want to try something a little more than the basics, Blue Apron is the way to go, and Blue Apron is treating listeners of the Eric Erickson show to $30 off your first order if you visit blueapron.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. So check out this week's menu and get your $30 off at blueapron.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. And think of it this way. Even the federal government says they want to model a plan after Blue Apron. So go to blueapron.com slash Eric. Welcome back. I'm Eric Erickson here in the WSB Live Lounge with Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams. We were talking about education when we went to break, and one of the questions I actually got uh, from someone was uh, directed to you. Uh, Tyler wants to know, um, what do you think of the situation with Georgia teachers feeling like they have to teach tests, being graded on how their students perform the tests, while they're dealing with family problems brought into schools. I think that we have to understand that teaching to the test is not helping our children. Education is not about memorization. It's about comprehension and the ability to think. And in response to declining standards, we've gone to this rote memorization approach, which is deeply problematic, and it ignores the whole life of the child. That if you are worried because you're suffering from trauma, 
because you don't know where you're going to live that that night. If you're hungry, if your family is disrupted, we don't account for how those children are learning. Uh, But it also presumes that children have the same resources at home, that they have access to the Internet. We were talking about that. You may have a tablet that your school gave you, but if you don't have electricity and you don't have the Internet, if your parents can't afford it, then you are being not only taught to the test, but you're also being held accountable for something you can't possibly master. And the teachers are then held responsible for what's happening outside of their control. And so I think we have to really go back to the fundamentals of education and get back to understanding what do we want children to know when they are done and what responsibility do educators have, what responsibilities do school systems have, and as a leader in the state, what responsibility do we have to ensure that each of those metrics are met? Okay. Now, I get to ask you this question and find some common ground with you as a conservative okay. talking to a Democrat because I can't bring this up on my show. I get angry phone calls from people. But <laughs> I have a lot of friends who are teachers. Mm-hmm. And to a person, they're thinking of quitting. Some of them already have because they feel like the state over the last five to seven years has become so benchmark focused on how teachers perform that they've become administrators, not teachers, and that they don't even have time to deal with kids who are coming into school with problems about dads in jail, moms working multiple jobs, and that they're being forced to live to a standard. And it seems like, as a Republican, it it seems like one of the things that we overcorrected on trying to fix schools was doing objective benchmarks for teachers where there's multiple environments for teaching. There's nothing objective about a child. That That's fundamentally the challenge. Children come to school with their experiences. They may only be in the classroom for eight hours, but they bring everything that happens to them with them to that classroom. Teachers cannot be held accountable and responsible for the whole child unless they're given the resources to do that. And that's what brings to the conversation the wraparound services. We have to understand that the whole child is coming to school, and the notion of objective benchmarks ignores that, that totality. Where I stand very much in solidarity with, with educators is that we have a higher responsibility to invest in making certain that education goes beyond the four walls. But that also means resources go beyond the four walls, and that we acknowledge that, that a lot of our educators are parents too, and they have to have the ability to take care of their children as well. And so I I don't diminish the importance of benchmarks, but we have to have the right benchmarks for the right reason. And if we're using benchmarks to exempt ourselves from responsibility to actually fix our schools, then that's not a solution. The other reality is the benchmarks change every year. I mean, every single year we are fighting about some new set of (laughs) solutions, which means there's no other job I can think of where your responsibilities change every single year and you're held accountable for making other people do something. If I could get a four-year-old or fourth grader to do everything I wanted, I would be the queen of the world. (laughs) And yet we're expecting teachers to get new rules, get new lessons, do this but not that that we told you to do just last year, get this education that we've now decided is irrelevant, and make certain that this child who is hungry, whose father is in jail, and whose mother has a substance abuse problem, Make sure that that child performs exactly the same as a child from a, a wealthy family who has every resource. That is a nonsensical and impossible standard, and it's our responsibility as leaders to decouple our goal of winning and reconnect to the goal of educating and making sure our children have access. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I want to shift gears pretty well, not super dramatically, but the other big issue that has been raised by listeners is the transportation issue in Atlanta. Um, And how, as governor, can you... I mean, it seems almost like everyone's in an impossible position of herding cats between multiple transit (laughs) authorities, um, from MARTA to the GTA to to what have you. How would you bring some sense to the process? Well, the first is that we acknowledge that there needs to be a process. Uh, Where Georgia has been crippled for so long is that we ignored the fact that the state has a responsibility for transit. I was very proud in 2015 to work with Republicans to get a transportation bill done to fund our transportation infrastructure that included, for the first time, massive investments in transit. But as we move forward, we have to do two things. One is deal with the Metro Atlanta transit issue, which has allowed different counties to exempt themselves from responsibility for public access. And I think that makes no sense. I think every county should be required to participate in public transit because we are 
a much larger region now. The metro Atlanta region, depending on the day, goes as far north as Chattanooga. Uh, and so we have to, I think, think about ourselves as a much broader conversation. We also have to understand transit's not just an Atlanta issue. Transit is a statewide issue. We have a fast-growing senior population. We have paratransit needs for the disabled. We have to think about transit as a necessary part of our transportation infrastructure. And while we may use Atlanta as the model, uh, we have to understand that this is this is larger than a single conversation about how do you get from Atlanta to Gwinnett. This is also about how do you get from Liberty over to Screven and how do you get from Macon over to Columbus. Those are responsible conversations that the governor has to have. And you have those conversations. This goes to the core of your question. It's not just hurting cats. It's acknowledging that the problem exists and that there's not one solution, but that everyone has to be able to come to the table. And often what we're fighting over is whether we have to pay for it and who gets to decide where the money goes. And my answer is, yes, we have to pay for it, and everyone who's paying for it should have a say in how we, where the money goes. Related to that, you've mentioned several times access to the Internet, um, particularly in rural areas. There, the state legislature had a study committee where they came out in favor of uh, altering the franchise fee into a tax and applying that to rural broadband. Um, what's your thoughts on expanding that? I, I think this, the responsibility to expand access to broadband is absolutely correct. I do not agree that it's through eliminating the franchise fee because the franchise fee is an important part of how we help local governments fund the infrastructure that they are responsible for. And it's unfortunately a way to pass the buck so that the state's not held accountable for its responsibility. The internet today is the same as the interstate highway system was 50 years ago. It is an important, critical part of our infrastructure, and the state is responsible for finding the funding to do so. And we can do so in, in innovative ways. We can think about rural um, using regional municipalization and letting smaller communities band together. Uh, Chattanooga has done this. Rome did it. They, rural municipal broadband is a very viable thing to do. We can engage the EMCs. They have infrastructure in a lot of these places. We have to think about how we do it, but I think the responsibility is not to shift the cost, but to understand this is a real standalone cost and that we have to bite the bullet and make it. As we get into spending conversations in the state, whether it's broadband or elsewhere, and the issue of taxes and windfall from the federal government, um, four out of the five Republicans I've I've interviewed, or actually three out of the five now, are want to completely get rid of the income tax in Georgia, go to a sales tax. Uh, the lieutenant governor says it sounds real good on the campaign trail for Republicans, but doesn't actually work. Um, Clay Tippins w wants to lower the income tax rate. Um, what do you see as a responsible step for governor to deal with the income tax in Georgia? I think the income tax in Georgia is fine. I think that we, I, I served on the tax reform council. I went to most of the meetings. No one listed our income tax to my memory as the reason to bring a business to Georgia. Uh, what they care about are the things our taxes pay for, public safety, good schools, good hospitals, access to services. Georgia has a stable tax system. Um, I like to think about it this way. When everyone's unhappy, it's usually because you're doing the right thing. Having an income tax and a sales tax stabilizes our economy. People point to Tennessee. Tennessee has one of the highest income, I mean, state sales taxes in the nation. Uh, they point to Florida. Florida has extraordinarily high, above national average property taxes. Georgia is one of the few states that in economic downturns does not lose its stability because we do have a balanced system. A sales tax is regressive, meaning the poorer you are, the more you pay. And the other part of the problem is that in an economic downturn, people might stop buying stuff. They don't quit their jobs. So when you shift to a sales tax, you're essentially shifting away from a very stable tax base to something that is very frenetic. And the last thing I'll say is if you look at what happened in Kansas, Kansas just did this. We saw in real time what happens as states try to move away from an income tax to a sales tax. They've nearly destroyed their economy. When Kansas is really thinking hard about electing Democrats as a solution to economic <laughs> challenges, it sends a signal that the policies you're using may not make sense even in a hyper-conservative state like Kansas. This almost goes full circle to, to where we started in this conversation. And it, this bipartisan view, not necessarily of policymakers of the state, but certainly of constituents, that Georgia is one of a number of states that likes to structure fantastic deals. As a lawyer, I used to help structure them to bring businesses into the state. Is there something 
that we can do public policy wise where we're not having to structure these deals to lure businesses in, just make it so they want to come? I, we have to improve education. We have to expand Medicaid to provide for stability in our hospital systems. Georgia has a, a very much um, state based or local government based healthcare system, which means our lack of access to Medicaid expansion has had a very deleterious effect because our counties pay for health care. Our state pays for health care. When we rejected that $30 billion uh, over the next seven years, we are forcing the state to pay for we're, – we're essentially crippling our hospitals. Um, if, you want, if you want businesses to come, they want good education. They want a workforce that can show up, so they need transportation. They want a workforce that's able to do the jobs that is about education, and they want the ability to ca- take care of that workforce, and that's about health care. Those are the things we have to do better. Uh, where we fight is about whether or not we have that responsibility. And so we structure these very you know, complicated tax incentive processes. There are some incentives that make sense. The, the film tax credit, I think, has worked because it wasn't about attracting a certain film. It was about building a pipeline of supplies so that you could build up an industry. That made sense. But any tax incentive that actually takes away from public safety, takes away from public education, diminishes our ability to actually serve those businesses when they get here. That's the wrong way to approach tax incentives, and it's the wrong way to approach a deal. When we come back, Stacey Abrams. Why Stacey Abrams and not any of the other candidates running for governor in Georgia? What sets her apart? Welcome back. Our final few minutes here at WSB with Stacey Abrams running for governor in Georgia. First of all, I want to thank you in particular for coming because I know WSB is a conservative talk radio station um, with a conservative audience. (laughs) And so thank you for taking the time to introduce yourself uh, to an audience who might typically not spend an hour with Stacey Abrams. And I want to give you the opportunity um, to address however you see fit. Why should people who listen to the station and everyone else in Georgia, why should they vote for you over any of the other multitudinous candidates who are running for governor? <laughs> well, first I want to say thank you for having me. This has been, uh, it's been a very good conversation. And, and I think that conversation is why I want people to think about me. I am a proven leader. I have been the leader in the House of Representatives for seven years. I'm an entrepreneur. I ran a nonprofit organization that helped register 200,000 people. I am a tax attorney. I'm also a romance novelist. We didn't get to that. <laughs> we did not get to that. <laughs> but, but the reason I talk about this piece is, is that I know how to knit together solutions. And Georgia has a lot of challenges, not problems, but challenges, things that are solvable if we have the right leadership, someone who is willing to work across the aisle where it makes sense, but who never believes that the answer is to attack someone, but it's always to try to find the right answers. Because the people of Georgia... They care about your party, but they care more about their lives. They want to know that someone wants to educate bold and ambitious children, that we want to build a fair and diverse economy, that we want an engaged and effective government, that you have a responsible leader who wants to make certain that government works for everyone. Not that it's a big government or a small government, but an effective one, because fundamentally that's this job. It's becoming the CEO of Georgia. I bring to it unmatched qualifications my educational background, my work background, and the proof of my time at the Capitol. And I think that on this day and this time for Georgia, we have this opportunity to to craft a new Georgia that we want, one that looks at the rural communities and sees opportunity and promise, one that looks at Atlanta and understands that we are more than just a slogan, that we can build a stronger Georgia together where diversity is a strength of ours and not a weapon that divides us, and one that can be respectful of everyone. That's the kind of Georgia I've, that's why I came back. You asked me why I live here and not in Mississippi. I came back because this is my home and I want to make it better. Stacey Abrams, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you.